going to be talking today about uh, National Audit Project 4, uh, an overview of that, and particularly about superglottic airway devices. The fourth National Audit Project of Difficult Airway Society in the Royal College of Anesthetists was looking at serious complications of airway management. And in 2007-8, we got all 309 NHS hospitals in the UK signed up to the project with a nominated local reporter in each hospital. And those local reporters were key to collecting the information from their own hospitals and sending them centrally where the data could be analysed. It was a two-part project and the first part was to look and see how many anaesthetics we were giving each year in the UK. And the local reporters collected details of all the general anaesthetic activity in their hospitals over a two-week census period. Some of them collected it uh, manually on paper-based systems and some hospitals that had electronic recording systems uh, the reporters were able to get the data that way. And the information gathered was collated to give us an estimate of national annual activity. And we were able to multiply by a factor, it turned out to be a factor of 25, to give us an estimate of annual activity based on that two week period. And that was validated against various other sources of information. So we're fairly happy that the information that we've got was accurate. We also asked the local reporters to give us information about the primary anaesthetic airway techniques that were used in the cases in their hospitals. So in answer to the question, how many anaesthetics each year in the UK, we've got 2.9 million in the year that we were studying. And when we look at the airway devices that we used, on the left we've got a breakdown and it's just over half we're using a supraglottic airway device, about 40% we're using tracheal tubes and only about 5% we're using face masks. And on the pie chart on the right we're looking at a breakdown of the supraglottic airway devices and in the UK only about 10% of supraglottic airway devices that were used in the reporting period were second generation devices. The second part of the project was to look at how many serious complications of airway management we got each year in the UK and the inclusion criteria were death, brain damage, emergency surgical airway or unanticipated ICU admission or indeed uh, an extension of ICU admission where that had been planned. Anyone could report to the project, so the anaesthetist involved could report a case, another anaesthetist uh, could report a case if they heard about it, surgeons, even patients or their relatives could report cases. And they came to a central email, and then from there it was correlated with details of where that event had happened. That was the only information that was given. The local reporter, when they'd confirmed that an event had happened, would then either fill in a computer-generated form themselves, or the anaesthetist involved in the case would fill it in. That was anonymous, so we couldn't go back and get further data, but the data we collected was fairly extensive and included free text for uh, clarification of what had happened during the course of the event. What we found in terms of general anaesthesia cases, there were 133 cases reported in the one year period that met the inclusion criteria. And divide that by 2.9 million, we got an incidence of about one in 22,000 anaesthetics where there was a serious complication of airway management. We suspect, looking at the statistics of uh, hospital clustering and uh, reporting clusters, that we may have missed three out of four cases. So the incidence may be as high as one in 5,000, but we know it's no less than one in 22,000. We also had reports of cases from intensive care units and emergency departments uh, of complications, although we didn't have denominator data for those events. All the cases were reviewed by a panel uh, consisting of anaesthetists, surgeons, nurses, emergency department doctors, intensive care physicians, lay people, so a proper multidisciplinary panel. And we were able to review themes, uh, generate learning points and make recommendations that form the basis of the NAP4 report. If we look at the supraglottic airways, there were 33 cases uh, reported out of the 133 where a supraglottic airway device was the primary airway used as intended at the start of the case. And there's a chapter in the report, chapter 11, which is dedicated to reviewing those cases in particular. Of the 33 cases, 17 of them involved aspiration of gastric contents or aspiration of blood. And there's a separate chapter on aspiration which deals with just those cases, but the single most frequent setting in which aspiration was reported during the whole project was during maintenance phase of anaesthesia where anaesthesia was being maintained with a laryngeal mask. And most of those patients, in retrospect, had identifiable risk factors for aspiration. And there are other chapters in the report 
where supraglottic airway devices are mentioned, uh, in emergency rescue, the CICV, and in fiber optic intubation chapters. So SADs appear throughout the report, but particularly in chapter 11, we're looking at uh, the, the supraglottic airway device problems. In that chapter, there were 16 non-aspiration events. Two of the patients died, five patients had emergency surgical airways, and 13 patients ended up being admitted to the ICU. Now those numbers don't add up to 16, but there were some cases where the patient might have had an emergency surgical airway and been admitted to the ICU, so there's some overlap in the data, which is why the, the numbers don't add up to 16. One of the striking findings was that people may believe that these bad events happen to old, sick people, but generally the patients were young. 10 out of 16 were less than 40 years old. They were generally healthy, ASA 1 or 2, and most of the cases were elective procedures rather than urgent. But we did find that obesity was much more prevalent in the group that were having problems for supraglottic airway devices. If we look at the deaths, there were two in the supraglottic airway group. One was where a supraglottic airway was used in a patient in a semi-prone position, and we saw a number of cases where the choice of airway, bearing in mind the surgery, was probably inappropriate. And then we saw quite a lot of evidence of inexperienced users, perhaps. Uh, people hadn't been trained or understand how to use the devices properly. We saw one of the other deaths. The other death was a case where the anaesthetist had put a laryngeal mask in the anaesthetic room. It wasn't sitting quite right, although they had got some CO2 back on the capnograph. And during transfer into theatre, the airway became dislodged couldn't be re-established with a supraglottic airway device and a tube was passed, tracheal tube, but it passed into the esophagus and that was probably unrecognised and the patient died as a result of esophageal intubation. When we were reviewing the cases, it became clear that it wasn't just a choice between a first generation laryngeal mask and tracheal intubation, that alternate options were available. That became clear to the panel as we were reviewing cases. And we recognise that there's a place for second generation supraglottic airway devices. And these are devices that have a drain tube, the tip of which sits over the top of the esophagus and can vent uh, gas and fluid. These devices have an improved cuff seal, so you get better functional separation of the respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts. And they have an integral bite block, so that the patient, if they're during emergence from anaesthesia, they bite on the airway, then the airway doesn't become occluded. There are a number of situations where the panel felt that second, genera second generation devices would be more appropriate than first. So if tracheal intubation isn't indicated, but there's some small risk of aspiration, perhaps uh, a patient who's got a hiatus hernia but they're treated on proton pump inhibitors and they're asymptomatic, then a second generation device makes more sense than a first generation device. Uh, if you're planning to use a laryngeal mask, but it's at the limits of its performance, so you're ventilating a patient, uh, or they're going to be head down or in lithotomy, or they've got a high BMI. Again, a second generation device is a more logical choice than a first generation device. In the UK, not all hospitals have second generation devices, but they should always be available, and that was one of our key recommendations. Even if they are available in your hospital, we were finding that people weren't using them uh, when their use may have been appropriate. So one of our key recommendations is that we should be using them more often and every hospital certainly should have them available. It's knowing when to use it and choosing the device appropriately. A variety of other recommendations which appear in that chapter, chapter 11, we saw uh, use of supraglottic airway devices for patients with known or anticipated difficult intubations. And the panel of, of the opinion that really we should be considering awake intubation in those situations rather than managing a known difficult airway with a supraglottic airway device particularly if the case is going to be prolonged. If it's your choice to use a supraglottic airway device uh, to establish anaesthesia, then maybe at the start of the procedure to do a fibre optic intubation through that device so that you've got a secure airway. We also noted that airway complications at emergence and in recovery were more common following uh, difficult placement or imperfect placement at the start of anaesthesia. So if you've got an Im imperfectly placed device, then it's not appropriate just to continue with anaesthesia with that device. You need to choose a different size uh, or perhaps exchange it for a different device, a tracheal tube. And 
we saw problems with uh, the removal of devices uh, and biting down on, on devices in recovery. So we need to make sure that our recovery staff are trained and competent with uh, supraglottic airway devices and their removal. So finally, there was a, a host of things that came out of the NAP4 report regarding supraglottic airways. Choosing the right patients to use them in, making sure it's an appropriate case, uh, that they're not contraindicated, incidence of aspiration. Uh, if you've got a high incidence of regurgitation or high risk of regurgitation, then supraglottic airway devices may not be appropriate. As Archie Brain said over the last couple of years, the insertion technique is key to these devices. Uh, it improves their positioning if they're inserted in the recommended manner. Confirmation of correct position is important. and We need to be sure that we're keeping an eye on them throughout surgery, throughout maintenance of anaesthesia. And as I say, that our recovery staff know how to remove them safely. Because the key feature for laryngeal mask airway is that it's a fundamental skill. We're using it more than half the time for our anaesthetics. But we need to teach the subject with the same attention to detail as we have done over the years with tracheal intubation.